These being the words of Erd Lom, chief churgeon of the former Ministry of Preparation, to the Prophet of Clemency, captain of the purveyor of resolve, for his eyes only. Your Eminence, it has been over a yearly cycle since our flotilla embarked on this journey to the Shield World, and we are no closer in finding this cloister, if indeed such a place exists. Worse still, our defenses are minimal. Should the fleet be compromised, we will be vulnerable against our many enemies. The Sangheili, the humans, the Flood. To meet these threats, or any other potential ones, it is long past time that we employ the use of an underutilized asset. An asset that has proven equal to that of the Spartan demons. Prelates, rebuilding our race requires protection and security. When Tembetek broke off from the flotilla, we lost a valuable commodity. It is vital that if, when, we arrive at Cloister to find these gene forges, we might have the potential to create a new generation of warriors to protect our own species, as well as stay off our own extinction. The leadership of the fleet must be made aware of their astonishing potential for our survival, and I know you have their ear. For this reason, I have prepared a well-documented account of the prelates, their creation, their uses, and their strengths. I implore you take these into consideration. The survival of the San Shayu depends upon it. To begin, I shall divulge behind the ministry that was once charged in the creation of these great warriors. The very ministry I had the honor of serving within. The Ministry of Preparation. Our ministry once oversaw biological research, genetic engineering to be specific. This proved to be a difficult endeavor, however, as the great forerunners had refined their own bio-enhancing tools and procedures for their own physiologies, not for other sentient creatures such as we, the San Shayu. It was taboo to engage in such research, as the slightest missteps could have jeopardized the already limited ability for San Shayun to reproduce. Thus, the Ministry of Preparation was the only ministry sanctioned in handling such a delicate matter. In this role, the Ministry would employ staffs of San Shayun Trojans to oversee the augmentations. Our Ministry also operated its own fleet of Mern Pattern agricultural support ships, such as the one we stand on now with their hunting facilities replaced or augmented with gene crafter vaults equipped with arcane instrumentation for the creation of prelates in the field. Our vessels now, however, do not have such luxuries. Ministerial churgens like myself were also used in the research and study of the majestic forerunner Dreadnought, looking to unlock the secrets of the Blessed Ones, hidden deep within the ancient vessel. This was before the fall of High Charity, however, and such research have been lost like most other accounts we have made. In time, all our efforts bore sweet fruit, and we eventually produced the Prelates. The first San Shayum warriors ever seen in millennia since the War of Wills. Hidden in the shadows, well out of sight for most of the member species of our once glorious covenant. The prelates were genetically enhanced San Shayum super soldiers who directly served our most divine and blessed hierarchs as escort details, and their own personal assassins should the need arise. Every prelate candidate was reshaped, mind and body, by the Ministry of Preparation using the ancient forerunner gene forges hidden within the secreted depths of High Charity. Most of our detailed records regarding the origins of the prelates were lost when the holy city fell prey to the parasite. But we do know the prelates have existed for centuries as an advanced order of stewards, bodyguards to the San Sayum of high standing. The augmentations provided to prelates were crafted within our sacred permissory of high charity and included genetic, physical, and chemical changes, as well as suits of highly advanced fighting skin armor and intensive combat training. 
we within the Ministry of Preparation provided them with the capability of releasing chemicals into their bodies to enhance their combat abilities, or to attempt to control their consciousness from any sort of trauma or any other such weaknesses. The fighting skin of a prelate included a standard anti-gravity belt that could be used to quickly propel themselves in various directions, or allow themselves to engage in limited flight. Their armor also included a gauntlet made of hard light, which when activated produced a crescent blade on the forearm, as well as a shield of hard light to deflect fire that managed to connect with a highly mobile prelate. They were formidable foes at their prominence if I do say so myself. Powerful enough to give even veteran Sanghili or Drilhane warriors pause. The augmentations we had given to the prelates were not without risks, however. Their extraordinary abilities were to be used only in short bursts. Pushed too far, their bodies could cause sudden exhaustion, seizures, and in rare cases, death. Their forms changed over the centuries, with the most recent one of late had been in development, inspired by the High Prophet of Truth's unsanctioned designs within the Sacred Promissory, illicitly based in some part on the human demons, though to what extent was kept between His High Holiness and our Minister. Those who became prelates were able to apply for removal from the role of celibates. The list that forbids San Shayum from having offspring. Following this procedure, though, some remained fearful whether these procedures may ruin potential chances for healthy offspring. Senior prelates in our San Shayum hierarchy would often retreat to the purpose-built garden of reverent contemplation for thought and meditation. For centuries, the prelates served the hierarchs with esteem, grace, and lethality. When the Jirohane were brought into the fold nearly a century ago, they were given smaller and older ships within the Covenant Navy. The Sanghili held no trust for the brutes, and had no desire to give them any power that might threaten their rather large ego. And no self-respecting warrior amongst their number would forego the rigors of battle to train savages, as they would want to call them. When the Prophet of Truth ascended to the hierarchy, the prelates were assigned to make up for this lack, officially. Before the Holy City fell, however, I discovered the truth behind these reassignments. They were to retrofit the Jirohane ships and train their crews to properly fight, not against our human foes, but the Sanghili. When the first sacred ring was desecrated and laid at the feet of the elites, they quickly fell out of favor, and the prelates accelerated their efforts for what was to come. And that came to pass months later. When the Sanghili were cast aside and the Jirohane were elevated to power, and the terrible civil war that all would come to call, the Great Schism began, within the shadow of the second sacred ring. As our fleets turned on one another, our prelates leaped into action, taking the Sanghili fleet stationed around High Charity unawares, destroying many of their capital ships. But then the flood came, our momentum fell, and the Sanghili gained the upper hand. Many of the prelates died at High Charity, either aboard the ship or protecting our most precious leaders as they tried fleeing from the city as the parasite consumed all within their wake. The only prelates we know that had survived this treachery were two, Tembetek and Das Bosfod. In an effort in rescuing the Minister of Preparation, Tembetek lost his family within High Charity, holding the Sanghili to blame for their deaths. As your eminence know, he and the Minister broke from the flotilla in a misguided attempt to take vengeance upon the elites, and we have heard nothing of them since. But, I've recently intercepted a few messages from the Arbiter and his prized lieutenant, Artis Vadim. They tell us much of what occurred following their exodus. Tim's path of revenge ultimately led him to the discovery of a miniature prototype Halo Ring. How in the gods he found such a relic is beyond my comprehension. While attempting to use this weapon to exact vengeance on the Sanghili, Tem would instead be confronted by an awful truth that he had been lied and used by the Minister of Preparation himself. 
a betrayal that had been the true cause of Tim's losses. In light of this revelation, Tem sacrificed his own life to bring an end to the nefarious threat of both the Minister and his prototype ring. What a waste. That ring should have been returned to the flotilla for our protection, maybe even replicated for our own uses, not used for some pathetic sentimentality. Das Bosfard was far more dutiful, however. Forged within our military, he served as the personal assassin to the High Prophet of Truth himself and it was he who provided the Hierarch's protection during his sacred mission to the Ark. Their departure from High Charity gave us a chance to escape without notice. It was our plan that we reach Cloister in time for once the Sacred Rings were lighted. We could emerge from the Shield World and reshape the galaxy anew. To our liking. Sad to say, these fantasies were quickly dashed, as many local Sanghuli transmissions confirmed. Truth was slain by the Arbiter, and his forces were eradicated within a month following their departure. It seems likely that Das Bosford shared his fate. Elsewise, he could be the last ember of our dying age, stranded on the Ark, if indeed it still stands. And I have no doubt he will make a valiant stand for our people, to the very last breath. With this in mind, I implore you once again, to take this message to Jom Ge'ekth himself. If the legends of Cloister and its immense gene forges stored there are true, its secrets could not only give us a chance for the survival of our people, but a means of safeguarding them from sure destruction. Do not dismiss this out of hand, I beg you, or we shall end as our reformist ancestors once did on Jandrik Wom all those ages ago. Ashes laid at the feet of our enemies. This is Chief Jurgen Erdlom. End transmission.